Last Sunday, we, uh, we started a, a new series on, uh, on creating bridges, especially in times of change and in transition. And last Sunday, we talked about endings and beginnings, and that how so often when, when we find ourselves at an ending, we want to hold on to that ending, and we want to, and we want to <coughs> dig our heels in, and we just want to hold on to it, because so we don't want to let go, because it is the thing that we know. On the other side of it, sometimes we get to something new that is beginning, and we are totally ready for that. Anyone who, uh, I don't know about y'all, but when I left uh, home to go to college, I was ready to go uh, about the last week of May. We still had a few more months left in there before it was actually time to go, right? Sometimes we're ready just to dive right on in with both feet, and we're going to be good. Often forgetting that there are still two or three more chapters of the story left to tell before we get there. Well, we need our bridges that help us to cover that divide, to take us from one to the other. And last Sunday we, we talked about, we started with naming what it is that we need in order to create those bridges well. That we need the Holy Spirit woven into every part of what we are doing. If we're going to build a good and a healthy bridge, we have to have the Spirit at work with us. Or better yet, we have to be at work with the Spirit. And there's a difference between those two things, how we, how we operate when we do that. If we know the Holy Spirit, then we have to know something else that's really important. And that is that there is a big difference between doing something and the Holy Spirit is with us versus us doing something with the Holy Spirit. Who's doing the leading? Who is doing the following? Who's doing the following? Something that get lost in too much of our discourse today when it comes to the Christian life is that we are not leaders of a holy army. We are not the vanguard of the heavenly host. We are not God's warriors on the hunt for the infidel, even. Our job is not to bring our faith from on high uh, down to the unbelievers so that they will know God, whether they like it or not. We are not the angel armies. And that's a good thing, because even for all of the great and wonderful things that we can do, and the great and wonderful things that we have done, and the great and wonderful things that we will do in the future, we are still imperfect, right? We're bad at understanding the world around us. We have this tendency to mess things up. We're sinful. If, if we see ourselves on the front lines of this war between good and evil, then we are going in the wrong direction because we are not suited to fight that very well. And that's because when we, when we see ourselves in that way, when we have that vision of who we are in those places, being on the front lines between in that battle, um, it, what it happens is that it legitimizes the evil. It gives evil more power than it actually has. And if we aren't careful, it will name that almost as equal to God. And that's where we have to be so very careful. Go back to uh, the garden. When Jesus had been praying with his disciples, and then the folks come up to arrest him. And in that moment when uh, they say that they're going to arrest him and they go to get him, there is one of, one of the disciples pulls out a sword and cuts off the ear of uh, one of the servants of the high priest. That's our response a lot of times, isn't it? To fight fire with fire, you don't bring pacifism to a sword fight. Like this is what this is what we do. That can be our natural response. But what does Jesus reply in that moment? Jesus' reply is to this. He says, "No more of this." And he touched the man's ear and healed him. This is where there's a couple of things that Jesus knows about this situation that we miss out on because we're just who we are. And we, and we don't always see very well. The first one is, it's more of a practical thing here. And that is, is that Jesus knew that his disciples were never going to win a head-to-head -head contest with the Jewish ruling council. And he knew this primarily because if they were to provoke them too far, in this case, as an example, if they were to, say, cut off the ear of one of the servants of the, of the people that were there, that would give them all of the ammunition they needed to go back to the Romans and say, hey, see what they're doing? 
They're going to lead a rebellion against you, and you need to do something about this. And the Romans would have come in, and they would have stomped on them and flattened them like we do cicadas in the driveway right now. That's what would have happened. That's the practical bit. The other thing that Jesus knows is that replying in kind isn't really the answer. And it doesn't really work because it doesn't ever really change anything. Because if we start replying in kind in the same way, um, we will always be replying in kind. And sometimes it may even feel like we're winning at it. But that's never going to be a long-term win. We'll never win the war that way because there will always be another war to fight. So what is it that we are called to do instead? Today is Trinity Sunday. And with that, it is important to know how we fit into things. Not where, but how do we fit in. We look at this and we see from our reading for this morning, this is Luke 24, we're in verse 48. Jesus says to his disciples, you are witnesses of these things. You are witnesses of these things. Go to that word witness. At its core, witness is a very passive word. We are witnesses of these things. You are a witness of an event. Someone else is always doing the main action here. And uh, we're watching, hopefully learning, hopefully growing, but always in that passive role. Also, traditionally, we are called to witness to our faith. But to witness is a hard verb to try and figure out because even, even though it is a verb, it's still kind of a passive verb. We've tried to make it active. We've tried to say witnessing is, is a very frontline sort of activity. And we can even, uh, we even know folks and have seen heard stories about folks that can be very aggressive in their witnessing to their faith. But we don't ever really see that kind of action out of it. In the New Testament, we don't see witness being used as a verb, really. So the only way we can begin to understand that and to define that is, how do we see it being used in any other way? We can determine our actions based on how that noun is used. And witness is always used about someone who is seeing something happen or has seen it happen and is telling others about it. So as a verb then, to witness is either always directing it to someone else or something else, or it is recounting what they have been a witness of. So to be a witness is always to direct ourselves, to direct attention to something else, to someone else. The witness is never the center of the story, and that's okay. Because as witnesses, we are being invited into something greater still, something else. To be a part of something that we can only do if we are witnesses and not trying to be on the front lines. Go one more verse ahead and we're going to verse 49. And Jesus says, And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Jesus now is speaking as God the Son, one part of the Trinity, telling his disciples that I'm going to send to you a, a God as Father's promise that has been made so that you can be clothed with power from on high, with, with God the Holy Spirit. Jesus is saying, I am sending this all to you. As witnesses, God sends the Spirit to us partially, so that we're just going to be in good shape to be able to go and to tell people about Jesus, to bear witness to our faith, but to do so in a healthy way. But mostly it is because as witnesses, we are now different. We are not the same that we were. As witnesses, we are now in a new relationship with God, and because of that, we are in a new relationship with the world around us. Through faith, through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, through the reception of the Holy Spirit, we are brought into that relationship of God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the only way that we can truly witness that relationship is to be a part of it. 
those are the reasons why trying to put action to that verb can be a challenge. It's why aggressive attempts at witnessing will ultimately fail, even if they show signs of working for a while. It's because it requires a lot of work. Aggressively witnessing goes against the nature of what we are called to do. The come hell or high water uh, approach to being a witness to our faith doesn't stick because it requires so much energy to maintain. And the folks that receive their faith in that way can only maintain it for so long because it's not natural to who we are. Either in time they will find a way to, uh, to despite how they receive their faith, to grow into a healthy, into a sustainable faith, or they will leave because they can't keep it up, because it's exhausting. And with so many options today competing for people's time, it's no wonder that we often see so many folks leave. In those cases, rather than creating a bridge, at best we've created a temporary dock that really can't handle a lot of traffic. Or we've told folks, hey, here's your pole, go and pole bolt yourself over there, well, you'll get there eventually. This is why we have to remember and to know that we have been invited into a relationship with God, with the Trinity, and be a witness as a part of that relationship. Otherwise, we'll be forcing ourselves uh, against the current. And if we aren't careful, we'll end up, just as the Pharisee from last week's story uh, was telling the rest of the Jewish, Jewish council, he said, you might even be found opposing God. No, as that part of the story goes, the Jewish ruling council actually did something smart and listened to him, and they waited. They looked to see what they should be doing, listening to the Spirit. So what does it look like to witness in a different way? To witness in such a way that we create good and healthy bridges. First, we remember that it is not our job to save every soul. That's impossible to do. And in fact, it's not our job to save souls. We don't have that kind of power. Only God has that kind of power to save soul. Second, we are witnesses. Witnesses share what we have seen through baptism and through communion. We know that we are called to live a life as a witness, to share that faith that, faith that we receive first through the community of believers that we gather and that we, and that we share this life with, and then through that witness that is our life, that naturally invites others in. How does our life, how do our lives act as a witness? I ran across a story uh, this week, and it is a, uh, uh, it's kind of an alternative plot line if you have ever uh, heard about the book Good Omens by Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett. It uh, takes the main plot of that story and twists it around just a little bit. And it's also English, so it's got that very dry English sense of humor, uh, which is why I kind of find it interesting. But um, the story that, that they tell, this little thing that I found, is it involves a, a man, his sister, their mother, and uh, the boy that uh, the sister has adopted. And the story starts off with, uh, with the mother kind of filling the son in on what has happened. And, and, the son, and the mother tells the son, and says, your church-going, God-worshipping sister adopted a, a small child. So naturally, the man is excited to see this child. Uh, but when he does, he sees this kid, and this kid is a menace. Uh, they, the kid is throwing things everywhere. He is setting furniture on fire, seemingly out of nothing. He didn't know where that fire is coming from. And, and uh, the child is chanting in Latin and summoning demons. Uh, the weirdest thing is that your sister doesn't seem to mind. The man looks at, the, at his sister and says, You literally adopted the Antichrist, Dan. What are you doing? She says, Yeah. I knew what I saw in the orphanage. I figured the kid, if the kid had some decent parenting, uh, that maybe we could, we, could, uh, we could avoid that whole revelation thing. Nasty work, that is. Like I said, that good dry British sense of humor. Uh, George, who's uh, the name of the boy, um, had been kindly changed from Damien 
approaches his new mother now with a spider, with a gigantic spider in his hand. Um, and then it promptly turns into flame. Good job, love, she says to him. Now uh, go find the rest. George's face makes no expression in, in that moment, but his eyes shine when he receives a pat on the head for his efforts. As the months go by, George seems to settle down. He adjusts to school and friends, and to the positive reinforcement that Anne gives him, she encourages the good that he does, even though the powers he uses aren't necessarily always to be classified as good. When she gets calls from the school now, it's about a rambunctious boy that won't sit still, not a destroyer of worlds and a destroyer of innocence. At Christmas dinner, the man lets slip his amazement to his mother and notes how good his sister Anne has been for, uh, for this boy and how he's improved. Now he is still summoning hellhounds to go play a game of fetch, but that's a step up. And the mother says, oh, he'll forget how to do um, all of that when he falls in love for the first time. And the mother laughs and smiles wide and says, looks at her just kind of incredulously and says, how do you know that? She just looks him square in the eye and says, because you did. Now, one of these great things about these stories when you find them out there is that they show some of the replies that come after that. And uh, so there's a couple of them on there that were really good. And the uh, first one says, okay, so someone, please write the story of the family of super low-key holy warriors who have made it their mission to locate the Antichrist in every generation because when one is spoiled, they go back and they try again, and adopts them and loves them into not being the Antichrist anymore, thus perpetually delaying the apocalypse. And then the last comment that I really like, defying the apocalypse via good parenting. He says, I love this. And there is something about, something that I love about this idea of being a super low-key holy warrior because we're reminded that our job is not to try and be on the front lines firing holy hand grenades, but to, when we come across other people, to invite them in, just as we were invited in. Even when, or especially when, it looks like their life is a complete and total disaster, and there is no way on God's green earth that they can be saved. The truth of the matter is, is that they can't be saved. Not if our approach is to fire at them from across a giant chasm. What I like about this story is that love wins. Not because you're hugging the devil out of someone, but that we love them even when the bad parts are still shining through. We are a loving witness that is encouraging, correcting as needed, guiding, providing wisdom, but mostly sticking with them so that they know that we are still there. Loving them at first because we are called to love them through our faith, but then because we find that genuine love that we have for them and know that folks know the difference. They know the difference between that love that uh, sometimes, I mean, maybe I'm the only one that does this. I share with folks because I know that's what I'm supposed to do. I may not like it. Sometimes it's that love that we share with folks because that's what our faith says we should do and we are okay with that. And we will share our love with that faith. That is a step up. But folks really get it when they know that you love them just because they are them. And why does that work? Here's where I'm going to take the Jesus Duke in the story. In the story, the, uh, the son points out to his mother that the bad things are still happening, even if directed towards good purposes. And his mom replies that he'll forget about how to do all the bad things when he falls in love. And the guy asks his mom then how she knows, and she replies, well, it worked on you. How do we know it will work? Loving someone until they know they are loved? Because it worked on us. And it's continuing to work on us. Even when we aren't sure of that ourselves, God doesn't give up. Who do you need to love like this? Who are the people around us that need to know this kind of love? We live in a world where people are searching for this kind of love, not the kind of love that gives them butterflies in their stomachs, but the kind of love that sticks with them 
and is vulnerable enough to share with that other person their witness. Not because they are trying to save their soul, but because that's just who you are, who I am, who God has made us to be. In the process of that, God will save their soul, and our witness is a part of it. As you go into this next week, who do you need to love just 